All right. All right. Hello. We have the hardest job of the day. You know why? We have to keep you all entertained while still making sure you stay here instead of going to the bar, going to the party, going to sleep. Wait, is the bar an option? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. it is not. It's not. Not yet. Yes. Soon. Soon. 35 yeah. minutes. Yes. So thank you all for coming to, I think this is the last session slot of the day. And we know it's late in the day and everything's going on. So thank you all for coming to this session. We appreciate it. Uh, today we're going to talk about the path to Helm 4, which is a topic I think many of you will probably be interested in because we've had Helm 3 for like five years. And so it's time to do some more interesting stuff. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So first, uh, let's introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Matt Farina. This is Andrew Block. We're two of the Helm maintainers who work on this stuff to make it happen. And yes, we do work at big competing companies here, Sousa and Red Hat, right? Um, and this is a time where rivals can get together around something interesting. But we do have a bunch of other maintainers in the crowd. If you're a Helm maintainer, um, any of that, can you stand up or raise your hand? Come on, I want to show some of you all off here. We've got some other maintainers in the crowd. Yep. So. Thank you, yes. So if afterwards you need people to bug, you've got more people to bug than just us up here. We've done our piece. Yeah, bug them too. So thank you. All right, so I want to start this off by talking about the past. How did we get here to where we are today? Um, it's useful to look at the past to consider what we're doing with going forward. So uh, Helm started all the way back in 2015. Uh, how many people in the room were even doing Kubernetes stuff back in 2015? How many of you heard of Kubernetes in 2015? Yeah. So Helm started off around the Kubernetes 1.2.1.3 timeframe as the package manager for Kubernetes. It started out of a startup called Deus as a, hack as a hackathon project. And Helm v1 was very quickly supplanted with work on Helm version 2 because uh, this is before the CNCF or any of this stuff and the Kubernetes project had something called Deployment Manager. And they said, look how popular Helm is. We got this other thing that's kind of complementary doing the same thing, let's merge them. And that's when Helm v2 work started to be something under the Kubernetes project. And that's where it got kicked off. And then next we had Kubernetes entered the CNCF because all of this happened before the CNCF existed and the CNCF was created and Kubernetes entered it in March of that year. And then uh, near the end of the year, Helm v2 was released. And that brought in lots of changes. It brought in things like Tiller, which somebody talked about beforehand, and it brought in a world of change. Um, and then we had this period where, you know, Helm started off popular in the Kubernetes space, but here we saw just fantastic growth in the use of Helm. Um, many people picked it up, there were new charts created, new ideas being created, new features going in, and we learned a lot in that time. But one of the things we learned was there were a lot of problems with it, like Tiller. And that's partly because when you look at uh, Helm version 2, this happened before RBAC. It happened before secrets were in Kubernetes. Um, there was a lot of change going on. There were things like the apps, like everybody's used to deployments. Imagine Helm started before there were deployments in the workload APIs. And so there was a lot of change that happened. And so we started work on Helm v3 to correct and, and work in these new Kubernetes things and uh, things that we learned. And then we had our first Helm Summit because Helm had grown so popular, we were able to bring together a group of people and just talk Helm and have our own conference just on that around charts and the ecosystem because everything was growing. And then Helm spurned off of Kubernetes and became a CNCF project of its own um, because there were just enough people involved and everything happening and the CNCF was ready to have more and more projects. So how many of you are members of the Kubernetes Slack um, channel Helm users? You ever wondered why we're over on Kubernetes Slack? That's why, it's our lineage. Yeah, right? Then we had a second Helm Summit because the first one was in North America and we wanted to have one in Europe, right? Just to bring in all of these people who were doing Helm stuff. And then we had Helm v3 go out um, in November of that year. And in fact, Helm v3 went out. Uh, yesterday was five years to the day from Helm v3.0 going out. So we're just after the release of that. And then we hit CNCF graduation shortly thereafter. Yeah, we've been graduated project for a number of years now. And then 
Helm V2 hit end of life because we had overlap between Helm V3 coming out and um, Helm V2 and then the charts. You know, Helm used to have a centralized charts repo where people put all of their charts in, which was a pain to maintain um, and it was expensive to ship and so we went distributed and this is the point when that went end of life. So that's the ancient past for how we got there. All right. I think that's this is mine. That's you. What did we do in five years? Well, it seems like forever and a half ago that Helm V3 came out, and a lot has actually occurred since Helm 3. Uh, first, post-rendering, being able to modify the manifest before they're added to the API of, of Kubernetes. My favorites, which I spent a lot of time on, is OCI support. How many of you have actually transitioned your charts to leveraging OCI artifacts? That's a good number. I, I look back maybe two years ago, I asked that same question just after that support came out. I got like one hand. So it's really good seeing the adoption of OCI. Uh, a more recent change is now we're, we're able to uh, store our index files as JSON format. That helps with performance. Then finally, we have a lot of auto-completion on the CLI, making it easier for users to be able to consume and use the Helm from a CLI perspective. So, with all the great things that have come, not only just us getting us to this point on Helm 3, all the things that happened since Helm 3 came out, time has come to look into the future for Helm 4. Matt mentioned it a minute ago, it's been five days and one, five years and one day since Helm 3.0 came out. Too bad we couldn't have been in the slot yesterday. It would have been really nice to have a five year anniversary time to actually go ahead and pop off the cork and start working on Helm 4. Lots changed since it came out in 2020. It came out, or 19, pardon me. Something happened in March 2020, I won't think about that. So when you look at back, this is actually predates that thing. So we, it's been around for a while. So why Helm 4? Three areas that we can call out with pretty quickly. One, like any project that's been around for five years, you're gonna accumulate a lot of technical debts. Because I can guarantee you, look in the code base of Helm, you're gonna see a whole lot of to do Helm 4, to do Helm 4. So if you get bored, how many did we find in the last session? We had the Contributor Fest, how many matches for I, I, I don't even know, there were so many. There were so many. Uh, and something to think about with technical debt. Who here in here is running Kubernetes 1.15 or older? Anybody? Anybody? I didn't think so. But we have dare code. You. Come on, raise your yeah. hand. We have code in Helm that elegantly handles resources from Kubernetes 1.15 that you can't get anymore because we don't break people and so we can't rip it out until we make a major version change. So that's when we talk technical debt, we even have things like that because we don't break people. And so you're the one that has the Crystal Pepsi in your fridge still. So. Probably. <laughs> uh, API versioning. We are extremely cognizant about semantic versioning. We don't want to break anyone. We're, you know, we're a stable project. We want to make sure that we continue to be stable and you continue to trust the project for your mission critical application. So we have a very, very hardened API policy. And especially if we're thinking about some of the things that we're thinking about in the community, we would probably break that versioning policy. And finally, with any new feature, new enhancement, new idea, they're usually bigger than a bread box, so putting it into a minor release probably doesn't make sense. So looking into adding it as part of a more of a feature major release is why we're thinking moving more towards the Helm forest out of the world. And also, it's been five years. The Kubernetes ecosystem has, in, has adopted and evolved. There's been new tooling. Go, our underlying you know, programming language has evolved. We want to start leveraging a lot of the capabilities out there, but still adhering to all the things you saw in the past, you know, in the past slide, the version policy, et cetera. So, let the games begin. Anybody on this one? I think you want to go with that one. Are you going to give me this yeah, one? Yeah, go ahead and right. give that one. All right. So um, the games begin. So with Helm, just like in Kubernetes, there's caps. And if you look at programming languages, they've got their own things. We have HIPS, Helm Improvement Proposals. So some things in um, Helm are very easy. You've got some debt, we've got to-dos, things like that. We can just go clean those up with a pull request. But we've got ideas that we want to do that are a little different. They're thoughtful. Which way do we go? 
right? Do we go this way? Do we go this way? How do we implement it? What users do you hit? How do you think this through architecturally? And for those, we have Helm improvement proposals, um, and those are done out of our community repo. This is where we think things through, where we justify why we're gonna take a path on something, and HIP1 explains how to do it, and we can do more lightweight ones for Helm 4 because a lot of what we've looked at is backwards compatibility and there's sections on it, and with Helm version 4, we can break a lot of that. And that is a wonderful thing to be able to break some of that backwards compatibility. But for those bigger features that we're gonna look at, they're all gonna go through the Helm improvement pro proposal process here, and we're gonna be doing that, or a lot of this, over the next couple months, because even before we get into some of this, we'll be doing that. All right, so we're gonna be putting a plan together for how we want to do this. And I think these are your slides. Uh, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna let that. you do I that. I realized that one, yes. <laughs> All right, you can tell it's the end of the day. It's been, it's been a long day, couldn't remember. Anyways, we put together a proposal doc which talks about what we're thinking about for Helm 4. This doc goes through everything from why we're even doing a Helm 4, we talked about that a minute ago, what prerequisites we need to have in place to move towards Helm 4, what might be in scope, what might be out of scope. We're gonna talk about some of the things that are in scope that we're thinking about. And then finally, like I'm sure like most of you consumers, when the heck am I gonna get it? Is it gonna be next month or next year or in five years? You asked you ask us probably a year ago, we would probably would have said something different, but now we've been thinking about it recently. We can give you a more concrete timeline of when we're, when we're thinking we're gonna get somewhere. All right, and now that's yours. All right, so the original timeline that was put together um, was 2021 for Helm version four. And so when we went and updated the docs, we we're like, oh wow, we were planning this before the event happened. But we have a timeline now. And the first thing is Helm four development opens, opens this month, and it opened yesterday. So we are prepared to take contributions for Helm 4. And we already we had, are, and we, we already, already are. are. We had our Contrib Fest this afternoon before this, and we got our first pull request in for Helm version 4. So it's open for business, developments on the main branch. Um, this summer in August is when we're gonna switch from doing all kinds of feature work to how do we start hardening down? And so what we're gonna do is stop taking in crazy changes and start sharing stuff with the community to say, test it beat it up because we want it beaten up before we go out for release. We're gonna have betas, or, you know, alphas, betas, release candidates as we work towards that, getting feedback from you. And this is not just for the CLI, but also for the Helm SDK because one of the things we wanna work on in all of this is make the SDK a better experience and people use that in their applications. We want feedback, we wanna learn. What little tweaks and things do we need to do um, along the way? So we'll shift into that mode in August and then November, we're gonna cut the launch. We're gonna release it next November. You know, Helm V3 had a very long life cycle of being worked on. It was two years. That was a long time. And there were major deep cutting changes. And people kept asking, when is it gonna come out? We're not gonna wait a long time on V4. And if there are other things we wanna do in a year or so in breaking, we'll work on V5. Because we won't wait as long as if there's that kind of thing again. But you're probably wondering, what does this mean for Helm version three, right? And so for Helm version three, we're not gonna break people. We understand people use this in production. It is widely used and adopted. So Helm version three is gonna be around for a while. New features starting now are gonna go into Helm version four and bug fixes are even gonna go into version four, but they'll be backported to V3. We're gonna keep up with Kubernetes releases and everything there, so V3 will continue along. You just won't see some of the new features landing there, in there because they're in version four. And then when version four comes out, you'll see a mass windfall of new features. But other than that, we're gonna keep trucking along with Kubernetes, or with Helm version three. And it'll go past the release of version four, and we're looking to end of life it in July after Helm version four comes out. We're looking at about eight months, which is two Kubernetes minor releases of still getting those Helm V3 updates. So you have time to migrate. It's not gonna happen during any holiday seasons or anything like that, or during company busy seasons. We wanna give people time to migrate off before we end of life support and you know, bug fixes and everything for Helm 3. So this is what we're looking for with the cycle of overlap. So this is the timeline and hopefully we stick to it. All right, so let's talk about what's out of scope for Helm, right? Because we're talking about lots of things that are in scope, it's useful to think of what's out of scope. There's a couple of things. One, charts. 
Everybody's got charts? We're not going to break charts, right? If your charts work in Helm version 3, they should work in Helm version 4. Because if we break charts, we know you and people watching the video after will hunt us down. Mm -hmm. You know our names right? now, we're, we're doomed. Yeah, we're not going to pull a Python 3 or you know, anything like that with Helm. The charts will continue to work, and anything that we do to charts will have to be additive for Helm version 4. Charts today will continue to work. The other thing that's uh, out of scope is changing the scope of Helm, right? Helm is a package manager. We don't want to change that. We're not going to we be want... new Coke? We're yeah, not... we're not going to be new Coke. <sighs> it's still be, we are not going to change Helm to be something different. Now, let me explain a little bit about what that means. I've got this picture that I like to use here, right? And, and you've got an operating system on the bottom, and then with your operating system, you're going to have binaries and you're going to have configuration, right? And then a lot of times you'll have a package manager that you use to install things on a system. And then on top of it, you've got configuration management that you use to manage your different things. And to give you an example here of something you may know, let's take a Linux system, right? You've got Linux on the bottom. You've got your binaries. Maybe you've got your configuration in your Etsy directory. You'll probably use a package manager to install it, you know, zipper, DNF, app, things like that. And then for configuration management on that machine or others, there's a variety of tools that do things in different styles. Right? This is a picture of the world of like a Linux system if you're going to do ops or DevOps for it. And, and you, each thing's got its own separation of concerns with the functionality that it does. Let's look at the Kubernetes space. We'll, we'll look at a Kubernetes picture here. So you've got Kubernetes on the bottom. You've got your container images, which are like your binaries, which you're executing. Right? You've got your manifest, which we'll call your configuration. Then Helm is the package manager to install your applications on the system. The same way you would have with you know, Linux or something like that. And then you can use a variety of things. And here I just put Flux and Argo because they're the CNCF projects. There are many projects behind it and many different ways to do configuration management. And we're happy to support all of those and see them being used because we know people have a lot of different styles for their configuration management, and that's okay. We're not going to expand there. So Helm is going to keep its place in scope while the other things can move around it. All right, so what might we do? What might we do in Helm version 4? Let's walk through a few of the things along the way. All right, the first thing is cleanup, all right? Here I've got up an interface, right, or a bunch of interfaces, and there's all these to-dos. So Go has the thing that says, once you create an interface, it's a breaking change to add a method to it, which means every time you want to add a method, you create a new interface, which leads to interface sprawl. And we've got a little bit of that. We've got lots of cleanup, lots of to-dos. And this is just an example. We can go clean up that experience inside of Helm. And this may seem boring, but it makes it a lot easier for us to maintain it and just keep things going forward in a nice, clean system, especially for SDK users. So what else do we do? Modern logging. Right? All of this happened before you had things like K-Log and Logger or the S-Log package in Go. We can do better. In fact, what we have is, is a homegrown way of passing around logging stuff. We can do better. We can do better integration with the way logging works. In fact, one of the hips we'll be doing here in the near future is which logging system are we going to use? Are we going to use Logger, which is what K-Log and the Kubernetes ecosystem uses? Will we use S-Log? How will this integrate? And we'll have to justify it and figure it out in order to have some nice integration here. But this is one of the things we're talking about, right? That's mine. That's yours. I know. You I'm, care about this. I do care about this. How many of you sign your charts? Why don't you sign your charts? <laughs> Come on, why don't you sign it? Yeah, PGP is easy. I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> it's not easy. It's not straightforward. And even I screw up, and I still love it. There are many different tools out there in the ecosystem for signing content. I can think of two of them, SigStore, Notary. We want to provide new options to be able to sign using a variety of tools. We're not going to marry you to one or the other. We're going to maybe make it more pluggable so you can plug in. We'll get there in a second, don't worry. Well, you're stealing my well, thunder here. I'm sorry, I was actually going to ask, how many people actually know you can sign and verify any kind of charts at home? Okay. okay, more people than I thought. Sorry. No, but, but that's bad on us because they know about it, but they don't want to do it because it's too hard. Yeah. Well, PGP is easy. <laughs> it's not. It should be. We're going to make it easy. That's, my, that's our dream. Our yeah. dream. Plugins. 
We want to make it so it's easier for you to make your tooling more extensible. We want to make it so that you can integrate different tools, different systems into the Helm ecosystem. We look at um, post renderers as being kind of a, a way that you can do it very hacky, and it'll customize, you can bring that in kind of, but it gets really, really funky. We want to make it a little more native, more simplified, make it so that you can develop things a lot easier. Um, and that's really kind of what we're looking to do, kind of um, going more towards the Kubernetes, the kubectl model for plugins instead of having to use the separate plugin model. Which we're, we're still trying to figure all this out in terms of how we want this to go. That's why we are thinking about it and we need your input. Now, we have a lot of great ideas. They might be crazy ones, but I'm sure you have a lot of good ideas too. And that's what we're gonna be doing over the course of the next few months is Hearing about what enhancements you want, we heard plenty of them during our Contrib Fest session about a couple hours ago. You all have ideas. We want to show you and provide you the venue, the forum for you to submit your content. Come to our community meetings is one of them for you to then influence the roadmap of Helm 4. Anything else you want to, want to talk about? Okay, beautiful. Now, most importantly, getting involved. How do you get involved? How many of you, show of hands, want to actually get involved in Helm? That's fine, because some of you are developers, some of you are consumers. We, have, we want to cater to all ecosystems. So how do you get involved? Number one, collaborate with us on Slack. How many of you, I mentioned earlier, how many, show of hands, how many are members of the Helm users channel in Kubernetes Slack? How many of you knew there was even a Helm users channel to begin with? How many of you didn't? All right. So that means that we all have a lot of homework today. It means that you're gonna go and sign up for Kubernetes Slack if you haven't already and join the Helm users channel. If you are interested in contributing, join the Helm dev channel. What I don't want to do, hit you to do is to go on CNCS Slack and join the Helm channel there. We still have it and I still have to go in there every few months or so when someone says, can I get some help doing this thing on Helm? It's like, please go over here. This is where we are. We gotta get rid of that channel at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Helm Forth, we've got, we got an opportunity to do so. Maybe. We mentioned earlier about creating the hip, the H4 hip. It's basically a normal hip, but focused on Helm 4. Getting more, and now Matt mentioned a lot about Helm, about, about hips, and a lot of the processes that take place in Helm, in hips. We can probably skip a lot of those because they're not applicable. Because, yeah. uh, because a lot of the things that we, they talk about in a hip aren't necessarily applicable to Helm 4. Yeah, and, and I mean, one of the, the reasons that we have those is we are, re, you know, Kubernetes over the years has changed a lot in its minor versions. It doesn't really follow semantic versioning or, or any of this. Go APIs change, everything else changes. With Helm, we have sought to provide a layer of stability on top of that. So the experience, the users don't break even as the ecosystem around them does. And so there's a lot of things in there that have targeted how do we teach this? How do we communicate it? How do we not break the world? And when you're doing a major version change and you can break, then a lot of those sections are not applicable and everything becomes a lot simpler. Yeah. And the easiest way to get involved and in actually make change and actually influence change, come to our community meetings. It's where you go ahead and interact with the members of the Helm community, you know, face to face ish. Uh, every week at 12.30 Eastern, 9 Pacific. Um, we, it's 30 minutes of all Helm all the time. It's great. Uh, highly recommend you join, and that's the best way to just get involved and get the pulse on the community. And if you're looking for details, if you go to the Helm repository, you go to the website, you can find out all of the details on where our meetings are and all of that. And one of the things that you, know, you just mentioned a minute ago, you might not be a go developer, but you might have a visual style. We would love to get any assistance on the, on the website. Yeah, and, and this is probably a good time to point out, we've got Helm, and we talked about Helm version four. When it comes to contributions, we've got a number of some projects, things that do chart testing. We've got stuff that allows you to use GitHub pages to host your charts and your index, and you know, uh, we've, got, um, we've got the website, the documentation, we've got translations in various languages, um, and we've got all kinds of stuff that you can contribute to. So if you're interested in these things, if you're a language person and wish the docs were in your language, uh, we've got all kinds of stuff there. We're, you know, we're open to contributions and to getting involved in very lightweight ways. Yep. Now the fun part. 
Questions and answers. Do you have any? And two things, please ask questions. Uh, yes. Well, can I ask somebody to come to the microphone? Yes. Because this will be recorded. So, so if it. we can get it with a microphone, then um, thank you. Then those who watch the video later can hear your questions. Without us having to repeat it every time. Will there ever be support for more than just Go templates? Because I've well, that's dreamed that's a good one. something right. other than Go templates. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'll give a little history on this. Helm version two had the ability to add other template engines. And a little nerdy history here. Um, Deus, who created Helm version one back in the day, was a division of Engine Yard. And they create the variable inside of Helm where you specify the engine was called Engine Yard. That's where I got the idea. <laughs> okay, so we had it back in the day. Nobody ever contributed another methodology to it. We invited people to do it. We asked them to do it. They never stepped in because Go templates always ended up being good enough. Now, we are totally open to it. That's why it wasn't there. Um, we're open to bringing it back if somebody has something else they want to do. We're very open to it. In fact, in the front row here, we've got this guy in this pink shirt here. Uh, everybody knows YAML in here, right? Well, well, this is, this is I, I mentioned this in our last developer meeting. Yeah, so, so he's one of the co-creators of YAML, so blame him for all your YAML yep. problems. <laughs> but right now he's actually, yeah. So right now he's working on something called YAML script, which is adding a, a bit of programming to YAML. And we've been having conversations about, is there a way to bring this capability into Helm? And so we're not only open to it, we have conversations. So if you have an idea of something, and of course we want contributors for this, we are open to the idea. It's going to come into who's interested in contributing and what we're able to do. Uh, can I say one sentence to the mic? You yes. certainly can. Please, Ingy. Hey, everybody. I'm Ingy.net and the inventor of YAML, or an inventor of YAML. Um, I'm giving a tutorial tomorrow about YAML and YAML script. And the main part of this thing is replacing or enhancing, it's not either or, it's, it can be both, um, Go templates with, with YAML script. And I showed it some, to some people today, and they're like, this is amazing. So yeah. I hope to see you there. Yeah, awesome. he, he's a tutorial session tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, please go check it out. Yeah. He knows more about it than I do. Oh, the YAML yeah. than I do, yeah. All right, what other questions do we have? Uh-oh, he's brought the laptop up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I know it's a somewhat widespread issue that go, uh, Helm charts have exploded in size because they have to include variables and you know flags for just every single possible thing that could happen. And I know that there was some work with the post renderer to address that. I wonder if there's anything in Helm for, uh, for that. And, and while well, we've talked about doing things with the post render to do something, is there something you're looking for? I guess, um, is there any kind of like major architectural change to, you know, like how you, um, like, I, I guess, I guess, do you see the post renderer is sufficient for now, basically? So I've long wanted to see more out of the post renderer to do more. Um, actually, right now, the post renderer points to scripts on your system, so it's not the most portable system around, although he's come up with some really neat stuff he's going to show off tomorrow. And uh, I'd like to see it become a full-fledged plugin that is easier to pass around and use. I think there is a lot of room for improvement there, and it's one of those things I'd like to see contributions on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Definitely. Oh, we got a line now. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's either in scope or out of scope to handle CRD upgrades. In <laughs> <laughs> so hard questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got that question earlier too. Yeah. In the trip fest. So. Uh, CRDs are hard, right? They're system-wide. Many Helm users actually only have access to the namespace. They're not cluster admins or anything. So how do you balance that? And we, have, we are so open to better ways to handle it. We have an informational hip, if you go to the community repo, that talks about why CRDs are the way they are, the problems we've run into, and we would like a good, elegant solution. We haven't had one we can move forward with proposed, but if somebody We're can come up with for something, it. We would love to have it. So if you're really interested in the CRD problem, you know, find me afterwards. We are open to talking about it, pointing you in the right direction. We would like to see something here. We just, it's a hard problem that we haven't figured out an elegant solution for. But we're very open to it. Yep. Yeah. Have you considered supporting a more advanced scripting language like Python or Lua for template generation? Ah, yeah. So I can answer this one too. So we had actually looked at Lua at one point, yeah. 
and said, hey, if we could add Lua scripting in, because then you could include the Lua with the chart and pass it around. And then this, this funny thing happened called WebAssembly. And WebAssembly exploded, and everybody was interested. Lua was like, let's go make WebAssembly great. And a number of the Helm maintainers actually ran off to do a WebAssembly startup. That's true. And now we're actually talking about, is there a way to include WebAssembly in charts to do that instead of Lua because you can include more programming languages. So we've been talking about that for a while. I don't have an answer, but I really want that. Yeah. All right. Pardon me if I try to take advantage of the large room, but I kind of just want to see a show of hands. Who here is a chart author for a chart for general distribution to end users? All right, of you, um, who has tried to convince an end user that wants a specific feature to use the post render and failed? <laughs> Pure hands, okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, that has kind of been my difficulty that because the post renderer is not, there isn't like a first class version of it, getting people to try and use um, something that's essentially just piped to a script. Most of my end users refuse to do it. Um, and I'm curious, like, what would be, you know, possibly in scope for making something that's kind of more standardized? So I, I have two thoughts on that, and I don't know if you have uh, other ones. My, my two thoughts are, first of all, adding something like what we talked about with Lua or WebAssembly in there for something that's packaged up with a chart. The second thing is I would like to see the post renderer become a full-fledged plugin system yeah. that has just a whole lot more cap. Don't just point it to a script. You know, point it to something else. Yeah, make, make it significantly more powerful. In fact, when it was being, when, when Taylor was originally creating it, he created it, he showed it, he said, yes, it's in. I'm like, ooh, can we not turn this into a plugin? And we never got there. But that was the next talked about step to just amp it up in capability. That's a little debt, it's out of the house. To do, later. Yeah, it's a to do. So if you're interested in contributing, we would love to have some work on that. Seems you're interested. <laughs> right, yeah. customize is the big one. Yes. So with the av advent of library charts a little bit ago, and at least what I perceive to be not, not a massive uptake of them, are there any plans to build either a common set, a recommended set of libraries, including functions, to deal with things like uh, Kube API version changes? to maybe avoid the mess and mess we had around English there, there, changes. There was someone who mentioned that having some kind of library set of capabilities or reusable functions that it was more standardized in the last ContribFest session. Um, I haven't thought about that, but we've heard two use cases now. Oh, yeah, yeah. so what I would say is uh, Helm has library charts. And so if somebody wants to go create one and start doing it, it's the lo-fi way to start one today. Um, yeah. But beyond that, there's just adding, so Helm uses Sprig as a library for its internal functions. There's that, there's things like YAML script. I think there's a lot of opportunity to inject more ways and we're open to making this easier. Um, but the lo-fi way today is, is library charts and then sharing those. And some organizations already create library charts and then reuse them all over the place to add those functions. I mean, I look at um, by the canonical example that I see in the community today is Bitnami. And they have a fantastic common chart, which they basically put into every single one of their other charts. And that's a pattern that we've seen across the Helm ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Any thoughts or ideas on improving the lengthening process for CRDs? So the which process? L Linting. So improving Linting. Lin Helm, Helm Lint for CRDs, basically, like ways to provide like the schemas and stuff like that? Um, no, but I'd love to see massive improvements to linting and a few of us were talking about that recently. So we're open to improvements in the whole linting experience there and absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah. All right, I think we are about at time. We've, they've been holding up that card saying it's at time. Thank you everybody for coming. Especially if, this late. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, if you've got questions, we'll be outside. Thanks everyone. Thank you.